Well, we're, today we're going to be looking at problems with preterism. Problems with preterism. Now, this may be a little more in depth than than uh, than some studies that we've done here, but uh, I think this. I hope this will be helpful for you. Yes. Is this a very prevalent thing? Or? This is an extremely prevalent view, particularly over in Europe and other places in the world, and particularly in some denominations. And we'll talk a little bit about some of that too. But we're going to be discussing preterism and some problems with preterism. Now, before we go to that, we have to make sure we define our terms. So I want to define what preterism is first for those who may not be familiar, and just to refresh those of us who are familiar with this topic. Now the word preterism comes from the Latin preter, and it means past. You know, things that have occurred already, things in the past, things long, a long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. And this is the belief that most or all of the end times references in the Bible, Revelation and more, have already come to pass. That is, these things have already been done, uh, it's already complete, and those who believe in preterism are called preterists. Again, basic, basic stuff. And I'm going to speak in general terms when it comes to this topic. Of course, there's a lot of details, a lot of nuances that we won't get into, but I do want to make sure that I'm accurate and that I'm you know, portraying their view accurately and properly as well. So we're gonna look at this and then we're gonna discuss some of the problems with this. Now within preterism, there are two groups, two views primarily. One says that every event, including the return of Christ, has already occurred. The final resurrection has occurred. The last day of judgment has occurred. These are known as full preterists or hyper preterists. Now this view is a heretical teaching and it is around. Just talking to somebody earlier, they know somebody who holds this view. So it is around and it's, it's not going to be explored very much in this session just because it's error, it's heresy. Christ has not returned yet. That is very clear historically and in the scriptures. The other is an older view. It's more, more of a historical view and it's a more popular view called partial preterism. Partial preterism. They believe that most of the end time events have occurred, but the return of Jesus, the final resurrection, the judgment are still yet future. And there's a lot of teachers, Christian teachers, who do hold to this view. You, some would believe in a future historical antichrist. Now, some of the individuals who held this view or hold this view, N.T. Wright, Gary DeMar, Kenneth Gentry, and one name that we would all be familiar with, R.C. Sproul. He held to a preterist or partial preterist view. Yep. Now, he did hold to a place for Israel still, but uh, he did hold to a partial preterist view. Now, most preterists believe that Daniel's 70th week, the Great Tribulation, Antichrist, and events spoken by Jesus in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24 and 25 were completed in the first century with the first coming of Christ, and as was mentioned, with the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD. And this date is extremely important because one of the key beliefs for preterism is that the book of Revelation was written before 70 AD, not around 95 AD, which is where most of the evidence does point to. Generally, they hold that ancient Israel finds its fulfillment in Jesus or the church. Again, there's the replacement theology that many of them, not all, but many of them do hold to. You know, so again, I am speaking in general terms here. Because many do believe the church has replaced Israel in some way or in every way. Which again, just makes no sense because if we get the blessings, well, what about the cursings? Do we not get those two? Well, no, those, those are for reserve for them. It, it just doesn't, doesn't fit. And they would say that God is finished with Israel, national Israel. Starting in 70 AD, the destruction of Jerusalem and, or the fall of Rome, some would even kind of expand it out a little bit more to the fall of Rome. And some would also say that the Babylon the Great was Jerusalem. And this is a view that you actually may have heard about when it comes to prophetic teaching. This is a view that's still around. Some would say that Babylon the Great is Jerusalem and that the last days were the last days of the Mosaic Covenant not the last days of this current evil age, which scripture does talk about. So these are kind of just a, a general overview when it comes to this situation, this idea, and this view. And there are many Christians who do hold this view. Now, this is not a salvation issue, but it is contrary to scripture. 
And we're going to explore some of those things here in a little bit. But next, letter B, the history of preterism. It's always important to find out where something comes from, where it began, a particular doctrinal view, a particular end times view, uh, a particular defining of a word or an idea when it comes to Scripture. You know, where did it start? How did it begin? This one's a little bit fuzzy, and there are actually two views of where it began. So you want to see, you know, who developed it, where it came from. And some state this view was a view or even the view of the early church dating back to the second century. There's really not a lot of evidence for that, though historically there were only a few who held a form of it in the fourth century, 300s AD, so hundreds of years. Now, some preterists and, and pretty much all non-preterists agree the first, listen to this, the first written exposition of preterism was by a Jesuit priest. And I may destroy his name, Louis de Alcazar, during the Counter-Reformation, which was published in 1614, right after his death. Now, he was writing to counter the reformers' historicist view of end times, which said the Pope was the Antichrist, and Catholicism was the apostate church. So if you ever wonder where that view came from, it came from the, the reformers. So this is pretty much the general agreed about any kind of written defense when it comes to the preterist view. We're talking over a thousand years later. So I think it's quite interesting how this took place. Among Protestants, the first to embrace this view was Hugo Grotius, a Dutch Protestant who wrote a book in 1640. And he said, well, the biblical texts refer to the Antichrist. That was fulfilled in the first century. Again, the, the basic preterist view. But preterism was slowly accepted among Protestants. And other church leaders held some kind of form of fulfillment of Daniel's prophecies in the first century. Daniel's 70th week, they would say, was fulfilled during that time too. They were really not preterists not how we would define them today. So it took over 100 years for this view to kind of make its way and move its way into Protestantism, where people really began to embrace the preterist view. So even if it started early, it was not embraced until centuries later, a millennia, <laughs> in fact, later. So when you consider this, I think that's very interesting and very eye-opening when it comes to this topic. Now, problems with the preterist view of end times. This is where we're going to spend most of our time. This is where we're going to really look at some things, and much more could be said, but we're just going to start hitting some of these things you know, piece by piece, bit by bit. Again, preterism looks at history, which I will say that I think that some futurists do ignore. I am a futurist. I you know, believe in the premillennium and, and everything. But we do forget history sometimes. We do forget that, yes, Jesus and the disciples and others were referring to 70 AD to an extent as a picture of what will happen in the future as well. And part of the draw of preterism is that there are roughly 100 passages in the New Testament that talk about the return of Christ being at hand or near or soon. You know, so for some, they think, okay, well, that means that it's going to happen you know, like this. Now, I believe those words indicate the certainty of his return, not necessarily the timing. Because we need to recognize that Jesus was considered a prophet, and he, he was the prophet that Moses wrote about. And he was speaking based upon what the Old Testament prophets would have said too, the same terminology, the same concepts, the same ideas, using the same terminology to describe the soon coming day of the Lord or God's judgment. I mean, how many times do you read in the prophets, repent, the day of the Lord is coming. The day of the Lord is at hand. It's the same idea, the same concept. And for the prophets, the future broke into the present, pointing to the final day of the Lord, which is still yet to occur. So when it comes to these things, it's really important to understand that concept. And we're going to look at eight responses to the preterist viewpoint and try to dissect some of these things. Now, they would probably have rebuttals to most of these things, but we won't get into those, of course. But I do think it exposes a lot of problems with this end times view. So first of all, when it comes to interpreting prophetic text, there's some issues. 
most, not necessarily all, preterists will say, well, you futurists, you're just too literal with your interpretation. Okay, well, if I take it in its historical, grammatical Jewish context, I have no choice or no other reason but to say that this is a literal fulfillment or not. You know, we understand there's figures of speech and metaphors and things like that. I mean, that's, that's basic understanding. But preterism is very allegorical when it comes to interpreting prophetic texts. It may refer to Israel in the prophets, but well, no, it's really about the church. Or it's about this, or it's about the gospel, or it's about something else. But what does the text say in context? That's what we have to ask. You know, to take things literally, face value or in context, and within, again, the Jewish thought means that God is not done with Israel. It is very clear in Scripture. And that actually upsets part of the foundation for which preterism is derived from. Now, we know there's figures of speech and prophecy, but to apply these passages to the church is faulty in numerous, numerous ways. It takes Scripture out of its grammatical context, out of its historical context, and out of its Jewish context. So this is a problem that they have when it comes to the prophetic texts. Second, the dating of the book of Revelation. Again, they state that Revelation was written prior to A.D. 70. They say, well, the real focus was Rome and the Caesars. They say, well, Nero was the beast. The mark of the beast, you know, you know was the coins that were marked with his image. Uh, 666 adds up to Nero's name, and yes, in Hebrew gematria. But it doesn't mean that Revelation was written before 70 A.D. In fact, as you look at some of these things, Revelation refers to Nero after the fact. Now, it was referring to the future, yes, but referring to Nero as what we would call a prototype, like Antiochus Epiphanes is a prototype or a picture of the Antichrist, just like Nero. Because this is a pattern of Jewish and prophetic and apocalyptic writings. We, we talked about this when we looked at the, uh, how to interpret the, the book of Revelation. Because in Scripture, prophetic events can have two or more fulfillments. Some say, well, the near far, immediate, and then future. But there can actually be more than two. It can be multiple fulfillments within the Jewish mindset. Because it's a pattern. And the evidence that Revelation was written about 95, 96 A.D. is much stronger. And we'll look at some of that here in just a few moments. So when it comes to these things, it really is important to get, ask these tough questions. You know, when was it written? <coughs> what was it referring to? And all these kinds of tap topics. So let's look at a few of these things. Now, the imagery of suffering within the book of Revelation fits better with Domitian's rule from 81 to 96 A.D., the Nero's rule. Now, what do we know about Nero? Was he a nice guy? <coughs> no, what were some things that Nero did? Yeah. He burned what? Burned down Rome. And he burned Christians. And he also blamed Christians for the burning of Rome. <coughs> what else did he do? I'm sorry? He was the one who had Paul beheaded, and Peter too. He was a madman. He was a maniac. Yep, Peter too. You know, so Nero did have persecution, but Domitian, his persecution was great too. One example, Nero never went to Jerusalem. That's a problem. He committed suicide in 68 AD, so he wasn't even around in 70 AD. So how could he fulfill what the Antichrist was supposed to do if he wasn't alive? Irenaeus, an early church father, wrote in 185 AD that John the Apostle wrote Revelation when? At the close of Domitian's reign. That was around 96 AD. So we have a historical reference for when the book of Revelation was written. Not before 70 AD. Historical references, internal evidence for Revelation indicate that it was written at the end of the first century. So that's just the dating of the book of Revelation. Now we come to a little bit more technical term in number three. This generation. And this is one of the primary arguments that, are, that is used when it comes to preterism. Well, this generation is referring to the one that Jesus is talking to. The word is genea. Uh, and this, again, is one key phrase to their beliefs. 
And again, they believe that this generation, you know, which Jesus talks about, was a reference to the generation that Jesus was talking to. But there's a few ways that Ganea is actually used in Scripture. It, it refers to offspring, birth, or descent, and also the quality or character of people based in Deuteronomy 32, which was a song of Moses and a rebuke against the rebellious Israelites. Let me read just a few verses from Deuteronomy 32. If you want to turn there or click there, you can. Uh, Deuteronomy 32. And, and we won't read the whole thing, of course. But as you read it, you find that Moses is not very kind <laughs> to the people. Look at verse 5. They have acted corruptly toward him, towards God. They are not his children because of their def defect, but are a perverse and crooked, what? Generation. Verse 20. Then he said, God said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be. For they are a perverse generation. Sons in whom is no faithfulness. So Jesus picks up on what has already been said. Generations before. Using that to describe the generation in which not only he lived then, yes. The character quality. But also what it's going to be like in the future for many of the, the Jewish people as they reject the Lord and embrace the Antichrist. So when it comes to this, we have to understand again the, the, the Jewish context when it comes to this topic. So when Jesus says this, he's referring to the nature of people and how often did he rebuke them? Read Matthew 23. Whoa, you hypocrites, vipers, whitewashed tombs. Whoa. Yeah, filled with dead man's bones. He, he was not very kind to the religious leaders of that day, and rightfully so. Because they were pushing people down and hurting people and keeping them from learning about the truth. And Jesus was rebuking his generation currently, yes, when he lived, but was also a reference that that type of idea, that type of mentality is going to continue until the end of the age when he returns in power and glory. And I've got the reference there that you can see. So, Jesus did talk about the destruction of Jerusalem. Luke 21 is very clear. And other passages, of course, too. But he was also looking to the future and the final fulfillment of what 70 AD pictured. But the destruction of the temple, the destruction of Jerusalem, took place roughly 40 years after Christ finished his ministry, was crucified, resurrected ascended but in his discussion in Luke 21 there's a shift there's a change and we'll look at that some of that here in just a bit and then he starts talking about the future at his return when he appears brings his rewards judges everyone not just Israel this didn't occur in 70 AD it didn't happen and contextually this generation are those who see the events that Jesus talks about which is still yet future Next, number four, the great tribulation. Now, Preterists would say, well, the great tribulation involved the Romans destroying Jerusalem and the temple in 70 AD. And it only affected the Jewish people rather than all of humanity. That's a problem. They say, well, it was God's judgment on the Jews for rejecting Jesus as a Messiah. Well, that part's true. It was, that was a judgment on the Jews for rejecting Christ. The book of Hebrews talks about this transition that was taking place. You know, stop you know, putting yourself under the law. That's passing away. The sacrifices aren't going to be able to be offered anymore. Because Je Jesus is the final sacrifice. So there is an element of truth to that. A.D. 70 was God's judgment. But preterism fails to understand that prophetic events again occur more than once in Jewish prophecy. So God did judge that generation. But the phrases that Jesus uses in Luke 21 are not localized to Israel or to Jerusalem or to the Jews, but to the world. Let's think about this. Acts 1. The angel said Jesus is going to return in like manner. What does that mean? Physically, visibly. He went up, he's going to come back down. Did that happen in 70 AD? No. No, no, he didn't. Let's look at a few verses here. Matthew 24, 21. 
For then there will be great tribulation, such, such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now. And then look at this, the next three words, nor ever will. So if this was fulfilled in 70 AD, then, well, that was the worst it's ever going to be. Well, I think that Hitler slaughtering six million Jews was pretty bad. And I think that what Zechariah prophesies about two-thirds of the nation or Jews being killed in the end times, I think that's pretty bad too. Much worse than what occurred in 70 AD. Let's look at a few other things. Matthew 24, 29 through 31. But immediately after the great tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then, after that event, the sign of the Son of Man will appear, where? In the sky. And then the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they, who are they, the tribes of the earth, will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory, and he will send forth his angels to, with a great trumpet. They'll gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. So here's the thing. Think, about, think with me. If the great tribulation was fulfilled in 70 A.D., the only option is full preterism. That's why some embrace that. Because they recognize you can't have it both ways. Because it says Jesus already returned. Well, why is that? Well, Matthew 24, Jesus connects the great tribulation to a second coming. After the tribulation or great tribulation of those days, you'll see the sign of the Son of Man coming. It's not a spiritual return nor just a judgment on Jerusalem. It ha oh, he has to have returned if you want to embrace that view. Matthew 24 and 25 go together. The Olivet Discourse. And Jesus did not return physically in 70 AD. I, I, I don't see him walking around anywhere. Some claim he, he, he has or they are, but that's not the case. So the Great Tribulation really mitigates against preterism itself. Now, number five, and again, I've, I've mentioned this before, but here's another one. They would say, again, it was all fulfilled in 70 AD. Now, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, they do refer in some sense to 70 AD. And there are some futurists who are not aware of what Josephus records in the Jewish war. And Tacitus, a Roman historian about what he wrote about the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. Now, some things that Josephus wrote were at least secondhand. But there were miraculous events that did occur at that time. And we cannot deny that, even as futurists. A star that resembled a sword hung over Jerusalem. That's a pretty miraculous event. A bright light shone around the altar. The eastern gate, which was a large brass door, difficult for 20 men to move, opened by itself. And this is what he records. Miraculous events that he records. He said, there were armies in the sky and voices speaking. Hmm. That's pretty uh, impressive stuff. <laughs> and some of these things resemble Matthew 24. And the destruction of 70 AD was an important prophetic event. We cannot deny that. But it was not the final fulfillment as preterism claims. Listen to what Luke records in Luke 21, 20 through 28. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then recognize her desolation is near. Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Those who are in the midst of the city must leave. And those who are in the country must not enter the city. Because these are the days of vengeance, so that all things which are written will be fulfilled. Woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. For there will be great distress upon the land and wrath out to this people, to the, to the Jews, and they will fall by the edge of the sword and will be led captive into all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled down underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are, are fulfilled. So destruction of Jerusalem is referred to here. But let's keep reading the context. Verse 25. There will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. And on the earth dismay among who? The nations. Not just Israel. In perplexity at the roaring of the sea and the waves, men fainting with fear and the expectation of the things which are coming upon the world. 
For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. So again, if you embrace preterism, you've got to embrace full preterism because Jesus connects these things. But when these things begin to take place, straighten up, lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. So it cannot occur in 70 AD. It cannot be the complete fulfillment. Well, why can it not be the complete fulfillment? Let's look at a few things. First, the locals in Jerusalem are not the only ones in view in this passage in Luke 21. It is a global picture. Yes, there's destruction, but there's also a global picture that Luke refers to. What is coming on the world. The day of the Lord's wrath for the world, not just for Israel. That, does, that did not happen, <laughs> as preterism asserts. Picking up off of this, there was no judgment on the world in 70 AD. It didn't happen. So if one sees the world as, well, it's just the Roman world. But where was the divine judgment on Rome in 70 AD? It didn't happen. It didn't occur. So preterists are actually factually and historically wrong if they extend judgment to the Roman world based upon Luke 21. There was never a fulfillment of the distress of the nations in perplexity at that time. It didn't happen. There was no response for people, oh, fainting with fear in other nations or the Gentile nations. It didn't occur. And here's the thing. Let her see. The world n never recognized God's wrath against themselves. We see that in, the, in Revelation 6. You know, the, the, the people are hiding in the rocks, you know, fall on us, protect us from the wrath of the Lamb. They didn't say that in 70 AD. You know, the Caesar wasn't like, oh no, God's wrath is here. He never said that. <laughs> and then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. They, but that, that didn't occur. Seeing visibly the Son of Man, seeing Jesus, that didn't occur in 70 AD. The world did not acknowledge this as Jesus said they would. So this poses a big problem for the preterist view. Continuing on with this thought. It fails to explain how the following was fulfilled. Now when these things begin to take place, straighten up your heads, straighten up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Nothing remotely happened in 70 AD that can explain this redemptive event in the context of all the other events of end times. So there's a lot of problems when it comes to 70 AD that some may not think about. And to reinforce this global eschatological context, verse 35, for it will come upon all who dwell on the whole earth. That did not occur in 70 AD. This is one of the dangers that we have whenever we pick out certain verses and don't look at the context of Scripture. This is one of the dangers of taking the Bible out of context. Not just prophetic texts, but any text. Now, devotions are fine. You know, you know, we only have certain time to read. You know, we can't read everything all at once, which would be nice. <laughs> but we have to take the time to look at the context of what the verses are actually talking about. You know, for some, they will only focus on this. Others will only focus on this. And they will exclude the other things. But you can't do that. That's why there's so many different views of end times and this doctrine and that doctrine because we have our pet verses to lift up what we want to lift up. And we dis dismiss those things that we don't like or that are inconvenient. But we want to make sure that we are workmen and workwomen who study to show ourselves approved to who? To God. Because we are handling His holy, precious word that He has given to us. And for those who are teachers and leaders, we particularly need to make sure that what we're saying is true. And if we have an opinion, this is my view, this is what I think, check me out on it. So, you know, again, I, I'm, I'm a pastor of a church. I don't want people to take my word for it. Study for yourselves. Look at it yourselves. If I'm wrong, tell me, please, because I'm not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. A few more details on this. There were additional details that did not occur in 70 A.D., Many false messiahs who came in the name of Jesus did not arise. Now, there were some, but not as many as Jesus said there would be in Matthew 24. Paul also talks about God taking vengeance, 2 Thessalonians 1, 5 through 10. It hasn't happened to that degree yet. 
God has not brought justice against those who have persecuted Christians. How do we know that? Well, persecution is still occurring today around the world. It's very common, again, in Jewish prophetic literature to mention an immediate event and a future event in the same passage, sometimes right beside each other in the same verse. <laughs> so there is a big problem with this view of this fulfillment in 70 AD. Next, number six. This age. Common in preterism is the, quote, age referred to, well, that's the end of the Jewish era, 70 AD. The beginning of the church or Gentile era or age. R.C. Sproul actually indicates this in his book on page 71 when it comes to end times. So this is actually a redefinition of the word age from a Jewish perspective and how the New Testament uses it. To the Jewish mind, there's two ages. This current evil age, to which we can all say, Amen. <laughs> and then there's a future messianic age where Messiah is going to rule and reign from Jerusalem, fulfill all of his promises to the Jews, be in the land <clears throat> that was given to them and they look forward to that because there will be peace finally. Preterism takes this phrase out of its Jewish and historical context. So <clears throat> that's a problem. Next, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. So let's think about this. This, of course, we know is the Great Commission. And at the end of this passage, Jesus says he will be with them until the end of the what? Not yeah, age. It's not world. It's actually age. Some translations say world, but it's actually age. While one of the five references to this phrase could refer to a preterist view, did Jesus mean, well, I'm only going to be with you until 70 AD? That would make no sense whatsoever. So this age represents a problem for preterism. Because if he was only with them until then, well, I guess we're out of luck today. <laughs> hmm. Number seven. The kingdom, the kingdom. This is a big topic, I know. But there is a misunderstanding of what the kingdom of God is in preterism. While we do experience some of the spiritual blessings today in the church, the kingdom of God has not yet come. There is war. There's persecution. There's viruses. There's uh, famine. I'm going to surprise you. There's actually corrupt governments. <laughs> I know you're shocked. <laughs> and there are diseases killing people all around the world. This is not the kingdom of God promised in Scripture. So the kingdom view is really a problem when it comes to preterism. Last, number eight, Israel. Again, preterism generally holds to replacement theology in some way. Some say God is not done with national Israel. Again, R.C. Sproul you know, would verify and say that he's not done with Israel yet. But you can't say the church has replaced Israel and say God has a plan for Israel in the same theology. It just doesn't fit. It doesn't work. In the Old Testament, repeatedly, you know, look at, look at uh, David Ettinger's series on the minor prophets. He emphasizes this over and over again because God emphasizes it over and over again. That there will be a time of great blessing for Israel. This is not referring to the church. Think about Romans. Romans 11, 1 through 2a, very clear. I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? May it never be, God forbid. For I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, the tribe of Benjamin. And just to reemphasize it, Paul says the same thing. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknow or foreknew. So God is not done with Israel yet. Now connected to this is the new covenant. Now again, again, we do have the spiritual blessings. But the new covenant has not been fully realized yet. Go back and read Jeremiah 31, 31 through 40. Read chapter 33. Though some may say, well, it was fulfilled in the first century coming of Christ. The language of the chapters does not allow for that. The church did not exist in the Old Testament as we understand today. According to Paul, it was a mystery back then. Read Ephesians. Read Colossians. He says that. Also, read the book of Hebrews fascinating book misunderstood book can be a very confusing book but it's a fascinating book it was written to jewish followers of jesus before 70 a.d before the temple fell because they wanted to continue in the law we see that in the book of acts but the writer says no it's that 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 is being dismantled that's coming down 
and later they were tempted to continue under the law rather than just trust in Christ and his forgiveness and possibly and probably to escape persecution from the Jewish brethren. But what do we find in Hebrews? The new is better than the old. Jesus is better. The old is fading. It's being replaced by the new. Let's look at a few verses. Hebrews 8, 1 through 8. Now the main point is what has been said is this. We have such a high priest, Jesus, who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister in the sanctuary, and in the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched, not man, for every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. So it is necessary that this high priest also have something to offer. Now if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are those who offer gifts according to the law, who serve as a copy, shadow, of the heavenly things, just as Moses warned, was warned by God, when he was about to erect the tabernacle for, see, he says, that you make all things according to the pattern which was shown to you on the mountain. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry by as much as he is, present tense, also the mediator of a better covenant, which has been enacted on better promises. Then the writer quotes from Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. Hebrews 8, 13. When he said a new covenant, he made the first one, what? Obsolete. But whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear. That's what they were trying to say. 80, 70 is coming, guys. We're not going to be able to offer the sacrifices anymore. It's time to come to grace. Hebrews 9, 15. For this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who've been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Not just the earthly one, but the eternal inheritance. So the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. That did occur. The sacrifices could no longer be offered. The new covenant was inaugurated, though again not fully realized. So does Hebrews prove preterism is true? No, not even close. On the contrary. That's not what the book of Hebrews is talking about. It points to Jesus. It points to the new covenant that's better and that the readers needed to move beyond the law to grace. So as we finish this up today, a lot more could be said. I know this is a very quick and brief overview. That's why you've got the outline <laughs> so you can go back and look more. So keep studying this. And again, while this is not a matter of salvation, it is a matter of proper biblical interpretation. Because if we get one thing wrong, that's going to connect to something else that we get wrong, that we connect to something else that gets wrong, and it just becomes a spider web of wrongness. I don't know if that's proper English or not, but, but you get the idea. There is a place for Israel and God's redemptive purpose. And we need to understand that. Now, I want to end with a few questions. When it comes to end times, I want you to think, what is your view of end times? Is it biblical? Have you tested your view in light of what Scripture teaches? Have you be moved beyond legalism to grace, as Hebrews talks about? You know, when it comes to this and every other matter, we need to learn to think biblically, particularly in our world and in our culture and in our country today. We so desperately need a biblical worldview in the body of Christ when it comes to every topic, not just end times, when it comes to everything, because we need to look at the world, society, decisions, finances, relationships, everything through what the Word of God says so we can again have that biblical worldview. Was Matthew 24 and 25 this incredible prophecy of Jesus. Was this fulfilled in history in 70 AD? Is this a prophecy that will be fulfilled in the future? Or is it a mixture of both and a happy medium in between? That's what we're going to look at today. I'm going to give a number of reasons, eight to be precise. I'm going to give eight reasons why I don't believe that Matthew 24 and 25 was fulfilled in history and why it's not a mixture of the two. This is an explicitly eschatological prophecy, and it's important that we understand that because it has profound implications, consequences, and ramifications if we believe something else. And I'll explain what I mean by that, why, and how that is meted out as we go through this. 
To begin, I want to quote one of the premier leading scholars and theologians of our day who believes the opposite, just to give you an idea of what the contrast and the different views are here, and then we'll work our way through the reasons why. I don't believe that this is actually a faithful reading and, and application of the text. This is from N.T. Wright, who is, again, probably one of the most renowned theologians alive on the earth today. He says this in his book, Who is Jesus? He says, when the Jewish writers spoke about the sun and the moon being darkened, when, he, when they, they spoke of a son of man who would come on the clouds, they meant this in a metaphorical way. Quote, it is flagrant, flagrantly absurd, absurd to think that Jesus, in saying this sort of thing, that he would come back, envisioned himself or anyone else literally flying around in midair on an actual cloud. This is in direct reference to Matthew 24, where Jesus said, at the end of the age, you'll see me coming in the clouds of heaven, coming in great power and great glory. N.T. Wright says, this is a metaphor, and it's absurd to believe that Jesus actually meant he would return in power and glory in the clouds. In his book, Jesus and the Victory of God, he says this, the coming of the Son of Man does not refer to the second coming in the modern, scholarly, and popular sense of a human figure traveling downwards toward the earth on actual clouds. The coming of the Son of Man is thus good first century medical, metaphorical language. He goes on to argue that when it said that Jesus will come on the clouds at the, end of the, at the end of the age, he actually meant Jesus would go away on the clouds at the end of the Jewish age, when, in fact, the privileges, identity, and destiny of national Israel were stripped from her and applied to, attributed to, bestowed upon the new true Israel, the church. This is actually one of the reasons why I believe it's such a destructive teaching is because it's at the foundational bedrock of basic street-level replacement theology. This is the reason why so many in our Bible schools and seminaries bought into replacement theology because they bought into Matthew 24 and 25 being a metaphorical event that doesn't speak about Jesus' return to Jerusalem, but speaks about Jesus going away in 70 AD when the temple was destroyed and Jesus ascended some decades earlier. And somehow that's supposed to be a coherent, intelligible one event that Jesus referred to. So let's look at this. Let's just work our way through it. Eight reasons why I don't believe that Matthew 24 is fulfilled in history. Reason number one, because the question that provoked the answer where Jesus talked about him coming on the clouds after the abomination of desolation in the holy place in Jerusalem that would cause a great tribulation such as the world has never seen ever or nor ever will be that culminates in his appearing, the gathering of the saints and the end of the age. That statement was given in response to the disciples asking a question. They asked this in Matthew 24 verse 3, Jesus, when will these things be, the destruction of the temple, the invasion of Jerusalem, and your second coming? When will these things be? What will be the sign of your return? And what will be the signs of the end of the age? Those are their three questions. Jesus is answering their question. When, for example, if I come to you and I say, hey, you're watching a movie. When's this movie over? And you look at the, the time and you say, it has an hour left. It'll be over in an hour. That means it will be over in an hour. When the disciples came to Jesus and they said, when will the end of the age be? Jesus answers their question and says, this is when the end of the age will be. And they ask, what will the signs of the end of the age and your return be? And Jesus answered the signs of the end of the age and his return. He wasn't addressing 70 AD because the age didn't end and Jesus didn't return unless you want to do crazy linguistic gymnastics and say he came in a phantom way in judgment, judged Israel, stripped Israel of their identity, placed it on the church and went back in a phantom way up into heaven where he's now sitting and waiting for us to come meet him. This is totally unintelligible. It doesn't make any sense if grammar and language mean anything. If I ask Jesus, when will the end of the age be? He's going to, and he gives an answer 
Meaning he didn't push them away. He didn't say, guys, don't bother with that. No, he gave them an answer. He explained it to them. He's kind like that, which is a reason why I love Jesus. When we ask him questions, he answers them. And sometimes he answers in riddles and enigmas, but sometimes he answers very clearly and simply. And in Matthew 24 and 25, he answered it very simply. This is when it will happen. These will be the signs. Now, N.T. Wright, again, referring to the, the preeminent scholar of our time, he dodges this by saying something very interesting. He said that Jesus didn't teach about the end of the age. He was referring to the end of the Jewish age because the Jewish people were subsequently stripped of their identity and covenant privileges. This is replacement theology. Israel's cast away. We take their place. Jesus didn't mean what he said, that he would come on clouds. That's a metaphor, and it's absurd to take him at his word. I don't think that this is a responsible way to treat the Bible, and it's definitely not academic or in intellectual, which is interesting why academia and, and theological institutions believe this to be the gold standard baseline for how to interpret Matthew 24 and 25. It makes no sense. The second reason we don't believe it happened in history is because of the grammatical integrity of Matthew 24. What do I mean by that? In Matthew 24, the Lord is going to use a number of statements like these things in those days. If you go through the chapter, you're going to see that the birth pains of verses 4 through 8 are connected to the social pressures of 9 through 14, which are connected grammatically and chronologically to the abomination of desolation in verse 15, which sets in motion the great tribulation in verse 21 that culminates necessarily in the return of Jesus in verses 29 through 31 and the gathering of the saints. Which is why then Jesus would say this, this generation that sees all these things will by no means pass away until all these things take place. Meaning this, all these things are inextricably, inseparably connected together. You can't pull them apart. Meaning the abomination of desolation, the destruction of the temple, you can't separate that from the final tribulation any more than you can separate the abomination of desolation from the second coming of Jesus and the gathering of the saints. If grammar if language means anything, you have to see, say, acknowledge, and affirm that every event from verse 15 to verse 31 happens in one generation, in one lifetime, in one 42-month period. Or, here's your other option, you can spiritualize and allegorize and make metaphor out of the whole passage and say that the destruction of the temple in verse 15 was literal, but the second coming of Jesus and the gathering of the saints in verses 29 through 31 was figurative, was spiritual, was metaphorical, and it's absurd to take it literally. So my question to N.T. Wright or to anyone that affirms this is, why are you asking us to believe that the destruction of the temple was literal and the abomination of desolation was literal, but the coming of the Lord and the gathering of the saints was metaphorical? How do you, where do you draw the line in knowing what's literal and what's metaphorical, especially in a passage where there just is no metaphor? Meaning, in the parables, he's using metaphor and he's using allegory. But in that prophecy where he's answering their question, there's not a single symbol. There's no metaphor. There's no allegory. He just says, this will happen, this will happen, abomination, great tribulation, sun, moon, stars, second coming, gathering. It's very simple. The third reason is this, because of the second coming, beloved, when Jesus mentions the abomination of desolation, he mentions it in context to the end of the age and his coming. Remember, the key question, Jesus, what will be the signs of your coming and the end of the age? And he puts the abomination of desolation as the primary catalytic event and the primary sign of his near return. It's the single event, in fact. There is no other event in Matthew 24. Now, there's trends, you know, earthquakes, wars, famines, 
there's these things, but those things aren't signs. Those are the beginning of birth pains. The primary sign generationally is the abomination that causes desolation in Jerusalem that impacts Judea and the surrounding wilderness nations that sets in motion a time of tribulation. In verse 29, Jesus says this, immediately after the tribulation of those days, you will see Jesus coming. Which means this, he says, hey guys, I'm coming at the end of the great tribulation. And you say, well, Jesus, how, when will the great tribulation start? He says, when the abomination of desolation happens. So how are we to believe then that verse 15 happened in 70 AD and verse 31, 30 and 31 happen in the future? So again, we have our three options. Did it all happen in the past? And this is all metaphorical, but kind of not metaphorical, or maybe it's a mixture. I was talking to a theologian a number of years ago who said, no, look, I'm not a replacement theologian. I love Israel. I stand with Israel. I believe in the future grace for Israel. But Matthew 24, part of it was fulfilled in history. I said, well, how do you, how do you decide that? He said, well, because the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. I said, well, fair enough. I affirm that it was too, but it wasn't the abomination of desolation that kicked off the great tribulation, was it? Was this the great tribulation that touched all nations? He said, well, no, I guess not. I said, well, how then can we believe that it's a mixture when Jesus says explicitly, the tribulation of those days, after that, I will come. That's a very important point. Reason number four, because the gathering of the saints. Jesus connects, because here's the thing. You can say, you know, okay, Jesus, his coming actually meant, you know, they do lots of... Uh, gymnastics with the, the original language, and they talk about how his coming actually refers to something else and the perusia, and they go into all this different language and play with the language and say, it doesn't actually mean his coming, it means his revealing or his disclosure, and it's talking about him revealing himself in judgment in 70 AD, which he, he did come in judgment, so that's what that means. Okay, so let's just assume for a minute that that's true. Jesus actually was referring to not his actual physical return, which poses problems once we get to Matthew 25, where Jesus says he'll sit on his throne of glory and judge the nations, but let's set that aside for a moment. Jesus is saying not only that he's going to come in some way, maybe in a phantom, metaphorical, allegorical way, but he also says that he's going to gather the elect from across the earth. So my question is this, when in, when in 70 AD did, maybe he did come in a phantom way and maybe I'm missing it, but explain to me how the saints were gathered together. You say, oh, they were gathered together in prayer. They were gathered together in a mystical way. He's gathering them together, guys. Let's not play with things and let's not let the facts confuse us here. He's gathering the saints on the day of his return, which goes hand in hand with what Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 2, the day concerning the day of the Lord, which is the day of the coming of our Lord and our gathering together to him. That day will not come until the falling away happens and the Antichrist is revealed. So again, you're stuck in a scenario of trying to separate his coming from our gathering from the day of the Lord, and it just doesn't work. That's the fourth reason, because the gathering of the saints didn't happen, guys. Maybe Jesus came in a phantom way, but he didn't actually come and set up his throne in Jerusalem as he said he would at the end of that passage. And he definitely didn't judge and separate the nations in 70 AD. He judged Israel with the nations as a rod of chastisement, but he didn't judge the nations in 70 AD. Matthew 25 says when he returns after the tribulation of those days, he's going to judge and separate the nations. That didn't happen in 70 AD. Reason number five is this, because there was no abomination of desolation in 70 AD. There just wasn't. There was the destruction of the temple, but even then, the way it happened is very not abomination of desolation. It didn't happen in the holy place. There was not a defiling event that's described in the book of Daniel where Jesus got the term from anyway. What happened in 70 AD? The Roman army took the area finally broke through, suppressed the rebellion, took the city of Jerusalem and said this, guys, don't touch the temple. Don't touch it. It's, it's a hot potato. Leave the temple alone. 
hired Arab legions, defied the order of the commanding generals, and attacked the temple and lit it on fire. Runners came to the general and they said, hey, general, the Arabs lit it on fire. And he said, oh, no, this is going to be a call. Colossal headache. This is terrible. Go scrape the gold off of it, which is why they rolled the stones down, scraped the gold off of it, and rolled the stones down into the valley, just as Jesus prophesied. But the point is this. There was no abomination of desolation described in the book of Daniel. It just didn't happen in 70 AD. What happened in 70 AD? Rome took it and said, don't touch the temple. Arabs lit it on fire. That's the extent of it. Now, the persecution of the Jewish people and the violence and the death toll was massive and catastrophic for sure in the first century in 70 AD that led to Masada. Massive. But there was no abomination of desolation, guys. I'm not denying the fact that the great tr there was a great trouble and there was a great tribulation in those days, but it wasn't the great tribulation. Why? No second coming, no gathering of the saints, no abomination of desolation. Which leads to our next point, number six. Because of the resurrection of the dead, Jesus is quoting Daniel 12 when he talks about the great tribulation such as never been nor ever will be. That's a direct quote from Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, where Daniel is having an encounter with an angel, and the angel says this, in the days of the abomination of desolation, there will be a great trouble such as never been since the world began nor ever will be. But he says this, in those days, fear not, Daniel, because your people will be delivered and many in the dust of the earth will rise in resurrection. Which means this, the passage that Jesus was quoting in Daniel 12, in Matthew 24, connects the abomination of desolation with an unequaled, unprecedented, age-ending cri crisis, tribulation, that culminates in the physical, literal resurrection of the dead. Now again, your option here is to deny the resurrection and to say that it's allegorical and metaphorical. He meant salvation of the world. But that's not what he said. The angel said resurrection of the dead. And the author of Hebrews, by the way, calls teaching about the resurrection of the dead fundamentals. Remember where he said, hey guys, let's move on from the elementary things, from the laying on of hands and baptism and the resurrection, which means this was a basic assumption, the actual resurrection of the dead that happens at the return of the Lord, that happens at the gathering of the saints, that happens after the great tribulation, that happens because of the abomination of desolation. The seventh reason why we don't believe it happened in history is because of this issue of the deliverance of Israel. I'm going to mention a few passages here. You can write them down and look at them later. In, Matthew, in Daniel chapter 12, where he references Daniel, there's coming a time of great tribulation after the abomination, such as never was. But fear not, Daniel, for your people, the holy people, your people will be delivered out of it. The deliverance of the Jewish people. In Jeremiah 30, verse 7, he says this, there's coming a time of great trouble for Jacob, for Israel. But Jacob will be saved out of it. Zechariah 13, 8 and 9 say this, that during the great tribulation, it says two-thirds in the land will be cut off and will perish. One-third will be brought through the fire and they will be my people and they will say, you are my God. In Matthew 24, he says that when Jesus comes, it says all the tribes of the land will see and mourn for him. That's a quote of Zechariah 12, 10 where those tribes who are alive at that time, the Jewish people in the land of Israel, will look upon him whom they pierced and mourn for him. This is very important. Catch this. In 70 AD, the events of 70 AD brought about the judgment on national Israel, the scattering of national Israel, and absolute carnage against national Israel. It did not bring about the redemption, the restoration, the deliverance of Israel. Why is that important? Because if you say that Matthew 24 was fulfilled in 70 AD, you're actually saying that 70 AD 
accomplished the exact opposite of what all the prophetic texts say about the final tribulation, the final abomination that causes the desolation that sets in motion the tribulation, namely the deliverance of Israel, meaning no deliverance of Israel, no fulfillment. This is the linchpin. Without the deliverance of Israel, you have no fulfillment of the abomination that causes desolation. Interestingly and conveniently, Mr. Wright and those who embrace this replacement theology, it's very convenient because metaphorical theology goes hand in hand and fits very nicely with a historical fulfillment, meaning they feed each other which is what I mentioned at the beginning. If you believe that it was fulfilled in history, I guarantee you, you probably believe in some capacity that Israel was divested of her identity in part or in full and divested of her destiny in part or in full. That is something that the Bible will not permit us to do. And lastly, number eight, which is a very important one given the dynamics that are taking place on the earth right now with this whole corona catastrophe and phenomenon. And it's this, because of the global dimensions of Matthew 24. When we go through Matthew 24 and 25, I want to encourage you to circle or highlight or just count on another piece of paper how many times Jesus mentions nations, how many times he mentions the whole earth or the whole world. Guys, in Matthew 24, the, these events are global in nature. 70 AD was very local in nature, meaning it was a, a limited military campaign of the Romans against the city of Jerusalem. The rest of the world didn't know about it. They just didn't know about it. And the crisis Jesus is talking about in Matthew 24, verses 4 through 8, he says this, look, guys, this all, there's, all nations are going to be involved in this, nation rising against nation, kingdom against kingdom. In verses 9 through 14, he mentions all nations in two very significant ways. The first time he says, all nations will hate you, which means this, if all nations hate you for his namesake, that means all the nations know his name, which means that the gospel will have spread beyond Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. But what happens in the first century is not that. Now, the disciples gave it a pretty good go. I mean, they touched the far corners of the Roman Empire within their lifetime, but they, the whole world did not know. All nations, all tribes and tongues simply did not know in the first century. The next thing, it says, when the gospel of the kingdom is proclaimed to all nations, then the end will come. And now we're ending where we began. Point number one, the question informs our interpretation of the answer. The disciples were asking, when will these things be and what will be the sign of the end? And Jesus says this, when the gospel of the kingdom is proclaimed to all nations, then the end will come. And after all nations deliver you up the tribulation and attempt to kill you, then the end will come. This is a global event, not a local one. And we'll end with this. In Matthew 25, the, the we call it the parable of the sheep and the goats. We really shouldn't call it a parable. It's a prophecy, not a parable. Jesus is actually going to sit on his actual throne, actually in Jerusalem, and actually judge actual nations for their actual decisions against actually the least of his brethren, the Jewish people, who are going to endure this final tribulation in a unique way. And he says this, I will gather all the nations before me and I will separate them as one separates sheep and goats, one for blessing in paradise and other for eternal condemnation and judgment. Guys, the culmination of Matthew 24 is Jesus, the man that we love and follow, sitting on an actual throne in Jerusalem, having inaugurated an actual government and judging all the nations of the earth. So I leave you with this question. Can someone explain to me how and why we are to believe that in 70 AD, Jesus came and judged all the nations and separated them as sheep and goats? Can someone explain to me how 
Israel was delivered in 70 AD. It doesn't look like they were delivered. It looks like they were judged, scattered, and exiled. Can someone explain to me how the gathering of the saints happened in 70 AD, or how the resurrection of the righteous dead happened in 70 AD, or how all nations were caught up in this great drama in 70 AD, or how Jesus came back in 70 AD, or why we're supposed to separate passages that Jesus grammatically bound together and said, don't separate them? If you can answer that, then I'm open to reconsidering the possibility that maybe Matthew 24 and 25 refers to history past or some hybrid combination mixture in the mushy middle in between. Otherwise, I think all of us should prepare for a future time of birth pains that lead to a future abomination of desolation that sets in motion a future time of unequaled tribulation that sets in motion the actual events that lead to the actual, not metaphorical, but actual return of Jesus to gather his elect, deliver Israel, raise the dead, judge the nations, and bring this present evil age to a close and a climax for his glory. Maranatha.